The Ferrari's rear suspension system cost 2.5 million euros, and we knew it wouldn't work well. For four months, there was ongoing talk about this major update, which finally came in July. First, it was tested at Mugello, then it debuted at Spa-Francorchamps, and now the results are finally emerging. Behind the scenes, in today's video, we will take a detailed look at why the Ferrari update didn't work and what was known in Maranello. Let's take a look at the statements from Ralf Schumacher and Gerhard Berger about the Ferrari environment. There are also some rumors coming from England suggesting Hamilton is considered done for in 2027 to the benefit of another driver. We obviously need to talk about the double pit stop issue for the Qatar GP. This weekend there will be the Las Vegas GP, so pay attention to that as well. Finally, let's talk about Red Bull, Christian Horner and much more. Before we start, please remember to give a supportive like and we'll see everything in detail. In Maranello, they were already cognizant beforehand that the alteration on the rear suspension would not effectively resolve the vehicle's persistent issues, yet they still chose to proceed with its production, expending more than 2.5 million euros. The issue with the SF25 originated long ago, even on the dynamic test benches when the car had not yet hit the track, the group led by Uxera realized that something was not right. The rear section was not functioning properly, being unstable, challenging to control, and incapable of operating near the ground without excessively wearing down the plank. The evaluations conducted in Barena verified that Ferrari was unable to take advantage of the optimal ride height, the one assessed during the project phase. This indicated a relatively straightforward concept, a reduction in aerodynamic load in nearly every situation. Competing teams, especially McLaren and Red Bull, understood how to adjust the wear point of the floor towards the front, thereby safeguarding the most crucial areas. Ferrari did not manage to do so, and consequently, each time they attempted to lower the vehicle, the SF25 moved beyond the optimal operating window. Ferrari's strategy was to alter the rear kinematics. Indeed, in an effort to rectify the situation, Ferrari halted other updates and concentrated almost exclusively on the rear suspension. The goal was to stabilize the aerodynamic platform during the most delicate phases, especially during braking. They therefore modified the first arm of the upper triangle, moving the attachment point vertically and longitudinally, extending the link and increasing the anti-lift function. In simple terms, they wanted a rear that would dive less during braking. Unfortunately, increasing the anti-lift risks worsening the squat during acceleration. It was a delicate balancing act and indeed the overall behavior of the vehicle remained essentially unchanged. The reality is that the update did not resolve anything. The update introduced to the track during the Belgian Grand Prix only marginally expanded the setup window. Beneficial? Indeed. Resolutive? Absolutely not. The original issues such as the ride height, the plank wear and the unstable rear end have persisted. But the rear was heavier, which Ferrari already knew. Here comes the striking part. Before going into production, the new suspension was tested for days in the simulator. One of the Ferrari drivers involved in the tests, whose name is not mentioned, but we are talking about one of the three who work regularly on the simulator, was very clear in the final briefing. Do not invest in this update. The problem is not resolved. The feedback was clear. After two days of intense sessions, the driver had concluded that the update would not bring any real benefits. However, Ferrari couldn't find confirmation in the data and after weeks spent on the project, they made a decision that weighs heavily today. They went ahead and built the suspension anyway. Subsequently, the tests at the seven post rig ensued, which were not particularly convincing. This accounts for the delay prior to the on-track debut. The expenditure surpassed 2.5 million euros, which is another crucial point. The update necessitated an investment exceeding 2.5 million euros drawn from the budget cap and consequently from other potentially more beneficial developments. It was likely a desperate endeavor. Perhaps it was justified to attempt as occasionally only the track can confirm or refute simulations, but in this instance, the track did not salvage the situation. In essence, an update already doomed before it was initiated. The suspension afforded Ferrari a bit more flexibility in settings, but it never resolved the genuine limitation of the SF25, which is a rear end that does not operate at the necessary heights to extract downforce from the floor. The project was flawed from the start, and this update didn't have the foundation to turn the season around. The hardest part to accept is precisely this. Ferrari knew it and did it anyway. The crucial aspect is that Ferrari invested more than 2.5 million euros in an update that ultimately failed to deliver the desired improvement in Ferrari's performance on the racetrack. In reality, while McLaren and Red Bull generally tend to wear down the floor in areas not closely scrutinized by the Federation, owing to the plank being worn in spots far from the Federation's sensors where inspections occur, Ferrari, on the other hand, when lowering the vehicle significantly, ends up wearing the plank extensively in both the front and rear sections, where the Federation sensors actively intervene to assess excessive plank wear. And here we clearly understand the reason for the removal of the disqualification in China. When Ferrari had finally kept pace with the other top teams, demonstrating to be a car superior to the others, in that race Ferrari was not legal according to the Federation. 
The modification to the rear suspension system did not yield noticeable enhancements, and this helps us comprehend how several months of development efforts did not significantly affect the SF-25. Perhaps those financial resources could have been allocated to other updates instead. But let's hear the rumors circulating in England about Hamilton. Lewis Hamilton and Ferrari will part ways in 2027, and according to multiple sources, the team has already chosen his successor, Oliver Berman. These are the rumors circulating in England, and it is no longer just a simple rumor. In Marinello, they consider him a talent to secure before another top team takes him away. One thing is certain, Hamilton will stay with Ferrari in 2026 to drive it as a single-seater in the new regulatory era. The goal is to give him one last real chance with a completely different car, from the ground-effect cars he has never loved. The contract with Lewis Hamilton, which will come into effect after the current option expires in 2027, it includes several clauses that allow him to decide his future based on performance. If Hamilton finally feels comfortable with a 2026 Ferrari, he might stay. However, if the feeling doesn't come, the choice of a replacement is already decided. The name is one, Oliver Berman. The first to say it bluntly is Gunther Steiner. They ask him if Berman should replace Hamilton and his answer is straightforward. If Hamilton is not up to the level, Berman must take his place. He is doing a fantastic job. Steiner even goes as far as to say that Berman started the season with some mistakes, but now he is as clean as few, beating a more experienced and much higher paid driver, and if Ferrari doesn't promote him in 2027, he will surely end up in another top team. In short, it's not just talent, he's already ready. From England, they confirm that Ferrari has chosen him and it's only a matter of time. In fact, Ted Kravitz from Sky Sport Formula 1, someone who knows the paddock like the back of his hand, reinforces this. It is as certain as the sunrise, Berman will replace Hamilton at Ferrari. And he also adds an important detail, the NIS are convinced to keep him even in 2026 to help him grow with the new cars before the move to Ferrari. A path identical to the one taken by Leclerc during his time at Alfa Romeo. However, Kravitz also casts a shadow as he is not certain that Leclerc will stay in the long term. Translated, the prospective lineup for Ferrari might potentially evolve into Eclair Berman, or perhaps Berman alongside another prominent name, should Hamilton opt to remain. In essence, Hamilton continues to embody the present of Ferrari, yet Berman signifies the future that Maranello simply cannot afford to relinquish. For this particular reason, if the year 2026 fails to persuade Hamilton, the red team will ultimately close the circle. The Briton will hand over the baton to another fellow Briton, one who has matured within the Ferrari ranks and is currently regarded as too formidable to risk letting go. And there are still some rules that will change for next year and will be confirmed on December 10. Let's take a closer look at what they are. Lewis Hamilton has always raced with the number 44, a personal brand that has become iconic, but this could change in 2026. In fact, in the last meeting of the F1 Commission, hosted at the Federation's offices in London, the new regulations were discussed and decisions were made that open up a completely new scenario. Drivers will be able to change their number during their career, a rule never seen in the modern era. The decision is up to the teams, numbers are finally free. Since 2014, every driver has had to keep the same number for their entire career. The F1 Commission has decided to remove this restriction. From 2026, everyone will be able to choose to change their number whenever they want. Who will actually do it remains to be seen, but Hamilton could be one of the names on the list. There are also other decisions in view of 2026. Many topics related to the technical regulations and the image of the single-seater have been addressed. The final versions of the regulations will be presented on December 10th. Technical, sporting, financial and operational. These form the base for 2026 rules. The matter of two mandatory pit stops isn't settled yet. The FIA, Pirelli and teams will assess it post the initial 2026 races. If the setup fails, it'll be revised. A minimum of 55% of the bodywork is required to be painted. The era of all carbon single-seaters is coming to an end. Starting in 2026, every car must have at least 55% of its surface area painted. This is intended to make the cars more easily recognizable, preventing grids filled with nearly indistinguishable grey carbon vehicles and encourage teams to differentiate themselves visually as well. The cooling system for drivers will be revised, as the famous cooling vest introduced this year has caused more problems than solutions. Many drivers have complained and the FIA has decided to redesign the entire system, aiming for the most effective version starting in 2026. These are the main changes we will see next year. It will be interesting to see if any driver changes their race number and also the rule on mandatory pit stops and of course on painted cars. It's important to have cars painted more than halfway, so I agree with this rule to make them unique and distinctive. But let's see Ralph Schumacher's statements about Leclerc. Lars Schumacher sends a very clear message to Charles Leclerc, don't trust Ferrari too much, prepare a plan B. He is doing everything he can, but it's not enough. According to Schumacher, the season for the Monegasque is solid, with seven podiums in a car that doesn't perform well and always pushing the limits, but that's not the point. Speaking to Sky Sport Germany, the former driver was direct. If I were Leclerc, I would ask myself what the point of all this is. Schumacher praises him, calling him a nice guy, perfect for Ferrari. He notes that he is close to getting married and that as a person, he embodies the image that Maranello wants. 
But then comes the blow, you can't rely solely on good intentions. Ferrari has disappointed everyone, Hamilton's arrival was supposed to be the spark for a comeback. Instead, the reality was completely different. 2025 without victories, the team dropped to fourth place in the Constructors' Championship fight. No weekend where Ferrari seemed like a winning team. The breaking point on John Elkin's harsh words towards the drivers. Talk less and drive more. A phrase that has sparked discontent among the fans and added even more pressure to an already strained environment. I would have already sent my manager to ask for explanations. Schumacher said he doesn't beat around the bush and he added, I always had a plan B in situations like this. Leclerc should do the same, as I wouldn't be fooled. The message is clear. Leclerc needs to stay focused, not be swayed by empty promises, and most importantly, not tie his future solely to a Ferrari that has recently disappointed more than it has delivered. And the important question is, what will Leclerc do? Ferrari has always been his home. It's the team where he grew up and built his entire identity in Formula 1, and it's the team he has loved since he was little, always wanting to race for Ferrari. How many more years can he wait? The 226 will bring a new regulation, a new car and another technical revolution. If Ferrari doesn't take off immediately, Leclerc will have to make a tough decision, stay loyal to the project or really start looking around. If Ralph Schumacher pressures Leclerc by suggesting he needs a backup plan, advising him to explore other options and find another team to compete for the championship, then we're talking about another top team like Aston Martin, McLaren, Mercedes or Red Bull. On the other hand, we have former driver Gerhard Berger who is more cautious. In fact, Berger warns Ferrari that when you don't win, everyone becomes emotional and calm is needed. It has been more than a year since Ferrari's last victory, with Carlos Sainz's success in Mexico City in October 2024. A dry spell that no one in Maranello expected, especially after a promising end to 2024, where the team nearly clinched the Constructors' Championship against McLaren. Berger knows the Maranello environment well, having raced in 96 Grands Prix and achieved five victories with the red team, and he analyzes Ferrari's 2025 season in this way. At Ferrari, expectations are always higher compared to others. If they finish fourth, it's inadequate. The key point is Ferrari is close to securing second, but second is never seen as an acceptable goal for Ferrari, it's just the minimum. And this is where the pressure comes from. When the results don't come, everyone becomes emotional. Berger also comments on Elkan's words, which have provoked strong reactions among the fans. When success doesn't come, people become more emotional. It's complicated for everyone, mechanics, engineers, managers, drivers. The message is clear, it's not just a technical problem, it's an issue of environment, tension and expectations. And on this, Berger agrees with Juan Pablo Montoya, who follows the same line as the Austrian driver. However, Berger defends the drivers, Leclerc is working very well and Hamilton is trying everything to win another championship. The issue isn't them, it's the context that's flawed. Staying united is key. The advice from the former Austrian driver is simple yet meaningful. Tranquility, consistency and unity. Furthermore, he provides a particular example. When Jean Tote initially arrived, it required several years before Ferrari transformed into the commanding team that everyone recalls. In other words, you do not reconstruct a victorious team by assigning blame or losing your composure. Stability and a well thought out long term strategy are essential even if the outcomes are gradual to manifest. We will see if the results come in the long term. Certainly Berger's vision is more rational. A bit of calm and clarity is needed for the future, especially since, let's be honest, this year's Ferrari was a failed project. However, there are many expectations for next year because the team is chosen by Vasseur with Loic Serra, Jerome D'Ambrosio and several technicians have joined Ferrari while others have left. The team has changed and is now ready to work for next year. They have obviously already started the project on the 2026 Ferrari several months ago and we will see what the result will be as early as January. There are many expectations. Hamilton wants to establish himself in Ferrari. He wants to stay in the environment and he will do so if he sees concrete results. But let's see instead how Red Bull is preparing. Mickey reveals that they have taken the biggest risk of the modern era. 2026 will be a complete leap into the unknown and it's Mickey who says this. In fact, the big risk will be building a power unit in-house. With Red Bull powertrains and Ford teaming up, they're gearing up to build their own power unit for 2026. Mecky notes there's been no challenge this bold in recent Formula 1 history, and it's true. In a regulation where the power unit is extremely important, diving into a completely new project is a huge risk, but in the long term it can also be a great success. Michi mentioned, I've heard the engine, and the sound is incredible. In a Red Bull video, the team principal also admitted to hearing the new engine. Of course I've heard it, the sound is fantastic, let's not worry about whether it will be fast or not. In fact, the power unit has been on the test bench for weeks and now we're entering the most critical phase, the last two months, where every component must be validated to avoid disasters when it hits the track. A challenge that could determine the future of Verstappen, in fact Red Bull's 2026 project is already in an advanced stage. The problem is that no one really knows the level of the competitors, nor that of the Red Bull Ford power unit, compared to Mercedes, Ferrari, Honda and Audi. 
And here's the real crux. The performance and the new engine will be crucial to convince Max Verstappen to stay. If the engine is competitive, Red Bull will be able to continue its winning cycle. If they fail, they risk everything, results, technical project, and even their four-time world champion. And this is true because if Red Bull is not competitive with its engine and in-house products, Verstappen will definitely leave. He wants a competitive car that allows him to fight for the title. There are several options on the table, certainly Mercedes, with Toto Wolff remaining open to bringing Verstappen into the team. I showed this year that they tried to get a four-time world champion, but then they kept Rossi. In my opinion, Mercedes doesn't need drivers because Russell and Kimi are very strong, but certainly when you have a four-time world champion like Max Verstappen on the market, you can't ignore him, and Toto Wolff said the same. However, Verstappen will definitely also consider Aston Martin to replace Alonso or to take Stroll's place if the car with the Honda engine is competitive. Let's remember that Adrian Newey is within the team and can make things work as he has shown in the past with McLaren, Williams and Red Bull. But according to Eccleston, Horner might really go to Ferrari. In fact, Eccleston didn't hold back when asked about Horner's future. I wouldn't rule out Ferrari, it's complete chaos there, and Elkan is even insulting his two drivers. Harsh and typical words from Eccleston that perfectly captured the state of the team. The atmosphere is quite tense, tensions are escalating, and a president who has recently criticized Hamilton and Clerk, suggesting they should speak less. Eccleston also adds a side jab. I certainly wasn't buying at Stone Martin with Horner. If Newey left Red Bull, it might be because he no longer wanted to work with Christian Horner. Ferrari had already contacted Horner before he was dismissed from Red Bull, but the talks didn't lead to anything. Now the situation is different, Ferrari is in trouble, Elkan is in the spotlight after his statements, the Sir is under pressure despite the public confidence of the president, and the environment is restless and needs leadership. Nevertheless, Horner possesses an alternative, more viable route within the realm of Formula One. Horner could potentially have discovered investors to attempt to acquire a team and introduce a fresh name as the 12th team within the Formula One circuit. It is indeed an ambitious endeavor but necessitates time, assurances from the Federation, and an extensive infrastructure. A return to the paddock would be much quicker with an already existing team. However, joining Ferrari today seems complicated because Elkin himself has confirmed the technical project and also Vassio's leadership. However, the name of Ferrari is coming back strongly, and there's a significant detail Vassar is not convincing. Elkani publicly gave his trust before the United States Grand Prix, but another truth is emerging from within. That statement was more to silence others than to truly reassure the team principal. Vasseur's position, in short, is not secure, and he will have his last chance in 2026. Should he fail, perhaps even before mid-season, Horner's name would automatically become the first on the list to become Ferrari's future team principal. This is Eccleston's thought, and we will see if it also reflects Ferrari's thinking. Horner might choose the longer path of a new team or directly enter the heart of the Ferrari case to try to build something from within. The very latest news flash I want to share with you is that for the Qatar GP, two pit stops are confirmed, mandatory for everyone, and each set of tires can do a maximum of 25 laps. Laps completed during free practice are also counted, while formation laps, reconnaissance laps, and laps after the checkered flag are excluded. This decision stems from 2024, when wear levels reached critical points, excessively wearing out the front left tire. For this particular reason, Pirelli aims to guarantee safety and prevent any unpleasant situations, such as a potential puncture that might endanger the drivers. Of course, the available tires will be the C1, C2, and C3, which are Pirelli's hardest compounds. Let me know your comments and opinions on all the topics we discussed in the video. As always, remember to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you won't miss any videos on the channel. Here from Lasituto, see you in the next video.